All right, so I'm gonna geek out here for a second. I was actually holding it in earlier, but I'm sitting next to DJ Mikhail. <laughs> I Don't know. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, I grew up with. Uh, I know. <laughs> I grew up with your TV show, Are You Afraid of the Dark? And then I went on to read the Pen Dragon series right here. And then I just jumped board with Silo. Honestly, I'm sorry, I skipped Morpheus Road. It was high school years, but I know, no. <laughs> well, that's it, I guess. Yeah, just kidding. But I'm just, thank you for sitting here and just allowing us to interview you. So? It, it's my pleasure. I saw some of your, uh, your YouTube videos. You guys seem really, really smart, and I like the way you do stuff, so I thought this might be fun. Let's go for it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, um, let's just jump into it. Do you have, um, did you have one defining moment that just kind of sparked the creation of Silo? Oh, no. Silo came about from a couple of different sources, mm -hmm. only, only two of which I can tell you. Okay. Otherwise, I'd have to kill you. Oh, okay, let's not do that. Yeah. Um, th my main characters, whether it's Bobby Pendragon or Marshall Seaver from Morpheus Road, or in this case, Tucker Pierce from Silo, I, I often start with a character. And in this case, and they're different versions of me. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I started with the character of Tucker, who is a, he describes himself from the book. He says, I am a solid B minus student. And that's okay in my book. So unfortunately, my parents have a different book. <laughs> and that was kind of me back when I was in high school, or a guy who was kind of comfortable in his own skin and uh, just kind of liked letting everyone else do the heavy lifting and everything was cool. So I wanted to write that kind of character who then had to step out and, and step up to the plate because of circumstances faced with a conflict. What do you do when you can't be on the sidelines anymore? So I kind of started with that premise of that kind of character. So that was one part. Um, the previous book series that I wrote between Pendragon and Morpheus Road were always huge, grand scale stories. Uh, you know, Pendragon was 10 different territories of, of Halla. Morpheus Road was it was the battle between heaven and hell, basically, which you can't get much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly with Silo, with the first book of Silo, I wanted the idea of doing something in a contained area. Mm -hmm. And this thing takes all place on, uh, takes place on Pemberwick Island. So I just kind of like that idea of doing I always like to try to challenge myself to do something I haven't done before. Mm -hmm. The third way that Silo came about is what I can't tell you. Because it really speaks to the, the theme of the whole thing, and it's things that aren't really revealed until the third book. So that third magical thing that I'm not talking about, plus having it take place on a contained island with a guy who has to step up to the plate, is that's kind of how Silo came together. So it wasn't any big, I've got a great idea. It's more thinking things through and putting them all together, and then voila, you know, Silo. Or the Silo Chronicles, as they're called. That's what the series is called. Very nice name, by the way. And I will think about that third one as I'm reading through. And you mentioned, you actually brought up my next question. Is there a reason why you targeted young audiences or uh, teenagers, young adults? You just told me that um, you actually... Um, all these main characters are different versions of yourself. Is Are you trying to send a message? or? Uh, yes and no. Um, I, you're assuming that I write for young people. I really don't. Mm -hmm. I, I just write what I think is a good story, and it happens to appeal to young people, and, and the young at heart. Um, I've been writing for kids, as you said, with Are You Afraid of the Dark, but even way before that, I've been writing for young people for a long, long, long time. Decades. You know, I started writing ABC after school specials, which you probably don't even know what they are. <laughs> uh, they were dramas that were on ABC after school, and they were special. <laughs> <laughs> but they were dramas, and that kind of stuff doesn't exist for kids on TV anymore. So that's mm -hmm. kind of jumping ahead. I kind of got out of kids' TV to write the kind of stuff I like to write. Um, and they're adventure stories. When I was a kid, the kind of wealth of middle grade and young adult fiction didn't exist. Mm -hmm. it, it existed, but not to the extent that it exists today. So my standard joke, which I've said a million times, is that from a reading point of view, I went from Dr. Seuss to Dr. No. <laughs> Dr. No is James Bond. Mm. So I went right from kitty stuff into full-on adult stuff at 10 years old or whatever. Mm. And so Silo is, uh, in all my stories, are uh, uh, kind of versions of the kind of adult stories I used to read back in those days. Uh, my favorite author was Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond books. Mm. Um, I also... Uh, read Alistair MacLean, who wrote a lot of adventure novels. And so Silo is a little bit of those kinds of stories, but written not necessarily for a younger audience. It's just the way my mind works. If I had a, thera if I had a therapist, you can ask my therapist why <laughs> I write that way. But it's just like that's what I write, and that's who it appeals to. I write for the young and the young at heart, too. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the only definite thing I do, knowing that I'm writing, and young people are going to like it, I, I, you know, I watch language. 
and, and things like that. So I'm a little bit cautious that way. But other than that, I just write what I think is a good story, and, and that's it. Okay. Um, I noticed, or um, actually a few of my friends and I noticed that in a lot of your books, you have usually a two males and then one female companion team up. It's kind of a, it's a trend. Is there a reason behind that? Yeah, well, not a reason, but it's, I keep falling into that because um, it, I, my main character is usually guys. And I've always lamented this. I would love to write a girl story. Mm. And when I mean a girl story, a, gr a story that appeals to girls mostly because I'd be selling a billion more books. <laughs> Um, and I was thinking actually for my next book series to do a girl uh, protagonist mm -hmm. and everyone was telling me don't do it don't do it because it's just going to be a guy with long hair you know, it's a, so mm -hmm. most of my stories are about a couple of guys who are doing stuff but, but I, I don't want to shortchange girls and, and I'm not good at writing girly characters mm -hmm. so um, that just seems to be the, the trio that always works out and I've thought about it I've thought about not doing it because People are going to start saying, oh, you're writing two guys and a girl. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it just, however I shake it, it's going to work out with a couple of guys going through an adventure. Or in this, actually with Silo, oh, you haven't read it yet, have you? Yeah. Oh, you have? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't want to give away spoilers, but um, it kind of becomes a guy and a girl that mm -hmm. go through this thing in the later books. No spoilers there. <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I don't do it intentionally, but it just seems to be that that's, that's the kind of story I want to write. And, and I always want to have a strong female character in there, and so it kind of ends up that way. Actually, um, do you know of Hayao Miyazaki? He wrote, like, Spirited Away, um, he wrote House Moving Castle. They're very popular animated uh, movies. Was, yeah, I've seen them. Yeah. Okay, he actually tends to use female protagonists as his, you know, mm -hmm. his heroines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why he does this is because he feels that they don't fit to a form. They're not required to save the girl or mm -hmm. save the man, mm -hmm. I guess, in mm -hmm. their perspective. They don't have to get a job. They don't have to save the world. They really don't have to do certain things, meaning they're free to explore other, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, topics. So with this next character or with any characters now, do you see someone that fits that? Well, I, I mean... <laughs> the next series I want to write mm -hmm. again I was going to write a girl for that yes. reason a and not just to change things up but just to be free of all the kind of typical guy restraints mm -hmm. but if people in the publishing industry are saying you DJ McHale would be making a huge mistake by doing that because you're ultimately going to be writing a guy centric story you're not going to write a girl centric story it's, not, it's mm -hmm. really great when I, I go on these uh, YA panels sometimes um, and my book's kind of tread the line they're between middle grade and YA mm -hmm. uh, they're younger YA and and I'll be on these YA panels and there'll be four really talented women authors and then we do readings and they're always reading these heartfelt passages of ah oh, this girl is just going through this difficult time and the dew is dropping off the tree and it's wonderful <laughs> and, and, and and I'm looking at the audience and I'm seeing all these girls just like Oh, it's so great. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is not what I write at all. <laughs> this is just not where my head goes. And one of the things I always say to young writers is you have to write what comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me to try to go there to write, I would end up writing the same kind of book, even though it was, I said it was a girl, mm -hmm. and it would turn off all my guy readers. That's one of the problems is that a lot of times, not everyone, it's a huge generalization, but, mm -hmm. but a lot of times guys, especially younger guys, if they find it's a girl who's the protagonist, they're not really going to be interested. I did a little research at my daughter's school. I was like, this one guy wrote a, read a book that had a girl protagonist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so how did you feel about that? It was a girl. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it was okay because she didn't act like a girl. Uh, so it's like, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, by not making it a girl, it's probably the closest thing I'm going to be coming to being calculating about what I'm writing mm -hmm. as opposed to just letting my mind go. But frankly, it would be a guy in girls' clothes anyway, so that's, that's what. <laughs> Is that how you felt with um, the creation of Tori in Silo? That she was kind of a guy in girls' clothes? Well, she, I think she was... Uh, I, I got the chance to write a character who had a lot more going on emotionally mm -hmm. than... I mean, it, the, truth, the truth is, and I'm making a generalization here, guys are pretty simple. Mm -hmm. They, and I see it. I see it in all ages. I don't care if you're three years old or you're <laughs> fifty years old. Guys are pretty, for the most part, pretty simple human beings. Mm -hmm. Girls are much more complex. And with with Tucker and Quinn, they're just having a good time. And they're they're. I love the scene where they 
judge how 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 cool she is because the way she ties knots. Because it shows she's I really like that too. Actually, and it's true. I think it's a true thing that she has that kind of confidence. She ties and whatnot, but but allows me with Tori it allowed me to get in something a little deeper mm-hmm. than just oh we're on an adventure and I have to step up to the plate. I mean, she's got a lot of baggage that she brings to the story, and I think she's she's a lot of the heart of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's also someone who Tucker doesn't quite understand. Tucker was such a painfully simple person. He comes across someone who is n- who is not a painfully simple person, and he's really attracted to that. Mm-hmm. So, and that's one of the things I try to do with my books is that I, I think the a number one important thing are the characters. And it, I'll give you an example. When when uh, when I did Are You Afraid of the Dark, I'd have writers pitch me stories all the time, and inevitably a pitch would sound like this. I'd say, Okay, what's your story idea? And they'd say, Well. I've got the idea for a flying mummy. <laughs> I, I just made that up. And I'm like, okay, who are the kids? And he'd say, I, I don't know, a couple kids. Anyway, this <laughs> flying mummy would fly out of the sarcophagus and come down at night. I'm like, okay, so who are the kids? Because it was always about kids. Mm-hmm. He'd say, who cares? I'm like, no, 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 no. I want a story about a couple of kids who I'm going to be interested in seeing what they're all about. And mm-hmm. I'd be interested in their story, even if they never came across a flying mummy. Because then, once I like them, once I care about them, once I'm interested in them, then they come across a flying mummy, then I'm going to be interested in them. So with my books, I try not to, even though they're full of adventure and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. I really try to create characters with depth that were interested in them as people mm-hmm. and what they're going through emotionally. It's why I often write about, it's one of the reasons I do write about young people is because young people are just trying to figure things out in life mm-hmm. while simultaneously trying to figure out whatever the flying mummy thing is too so it's really a way for them to kind of grow up and learn about life while they're also learning about whatever the fantastical thing is mm-hmm. um, and, and Tori does that for me Tori gives me a chance to to add another facet of, of their experience as people more so than just oh we're running away from the bad guys I just love seeing the contrast between Olivia and Tori I, I don't know why I just I guess I really like the complex character not saying that Olivia isn't complex However, I just, yeah. <laughs> Olivia is far more cl- <laughs> complex than you might imagine. But I just, for some reason, just had an affinity towards Tori. I'm glad that, well, you kind of get a feeling when someone's going to become a main character, and I'm glad she became a main character. <laughs> well, I, well, it's interesting you point that out because, I mean, Olivia, when you first meet her, she is such a cartoon. She is. <laughs> I mean, she is just the, the, the cute, manipulative, spoiled, rich girl. Mm. Um, but if you're reading closely... Over the course of the first book, Silo, there are a number of things that happen with her that she does, that she does, that are totally out of character. Mm-hmm. And, that, and Tucker makes mention of that. It's like, wow, I didn't expect her to do that. I didn't see her coming from that. And, and so those are some of the clues that I'm laying in as to what the big picture is on the whole thing. So mm-hmm. all of our characters make journeys. Tucker makes the biggest journey, but but all of our characters make certain journey. And and as I said, I write mysteries, so you need to be reading closely mm-hmm. to figure out what might be happening. And there's a lot more bubbling below the surface than you might expect. Oh, now I'm excited. Well, I'm always <laughs> excited. But I wanted to bring up now, how can you, you know, not talk about Silo and mention Ruby? So did you base Ruby off of an actual drug? Did you do any research on that? Um, uh, research, no. But mm-hmm. um, Ruby, it, there's two things about Ruby. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it has presented itself. It's, it's like a super steroid. I mean, here we have, it's the, and I'm not trying to make a story about steroids and the evils of steroids and all that kind of stuff when it comes to athletics. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of the way it's portrayed in the story. Uh, and, it's, and it's Tucker being tempted to use this. And it's one of the things I always like to do with my characters is to give them decisions they have to make. Mm-hmm. And the decisions they make, like life, it's not always black and white. Mm-hmm. And it's very rare that you say, well, that's definitely the way to go and because that's the bad way to go. So I try to present these decisions where like, okay, I think that's the way to go. And maybe it is the way to go, but because I'm going that way, there may be some repercussions because I'm going that way. And that's what I try to present with the ruby. I mean, it is a scary substance mm-hmm. that gives them abilities beyond what's normal, but there's a price to pay for that. And, and they're faced with the decisions that, gee, do we, do we use it for the greater good? So again, I always like to face these kind of moral and thematic de- uh, uh, dilemmas for the characters. Um, and you, you could draw the analogy to steroids, um, mm-hmm. but that's ultimately not what it's about. Um, the ruby in the later, starting with Storm, you find, actually find out in Storm what the ruby's all about mm-hmm. uh, and how it plays into the larger picture. Um, but the ruby exists for a very specific 
purpose and that's just hinted at in silo and it really comes to bear in, in storm mm-hmm. so uh, and I was a little nervous frankly I was nervous that um, <laughs> I, I know that people immediately draw the analogy to steroids and so then I'm thinking well will the younger readers not want to read that you know because it's a little bit controversial and steroids so, but no no nobody cares they, mm-hmm. they can handle it I actually loved how you added that complexity because usually when I read about a character taking, you know, something that resembles an illegal substance, they either love it or they hate it. However, you could see that after that first time he used it, he had that temptation, but he was scared by it, and it was just added depth that I loved. Well, I, th- I think. Well, that's. I think that's um, steroids or any kind of drug that may be interesting to use. <laughs> it's. It's. There's a scary component. Mm-hmm. If, if you have any sense about you, there's a scary <laughs> component. It's like, wow, that was cool, but yikes. Oh, that's a little scary. So that's kind of what I wanted to show a little bit. Mm-hmm. And you captured it perfectly. Now, I wanted to bring up, uh, can we expect any crossovers? Because I do recall that you did have some crossovers in some of your other series. No. No? Um, in fact, I tried to. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I would try to say this without giving away a spoiler. Um, with Pendragon, Bobby Pendragon lives in Stony Brook, Connecticut, mm-hmm. which is based on my hometown of Greenwich, Connecticut. You could go to Greenwich and go to all the places that Bobby went to. Just for fun, with Morpheus Road, I had Marshall Sievert live in Stony Brook, Connecticut. Just mm-hmm. as a nod to my readers, just say, oh, cool. And you kind of, and it was easy. Because <laughs> I already wrote the place. <laughs> so, so I did that just for fun. Mm-hmm. With, with Morpheus Road, it grew into something more, where the two stories kind of had a mythological connection as the story went on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't plan that at first. It just kind of grew as it came out. With Silo... Tucker lives on Pemberwick Island, which is a, uh, uh, a made-up island off the coast of Maine, Portland, Maine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually based on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off the coast of Massachusetts. Um, so it's a very real place. And, but Tucker came from another town originally, and I was going to have Tucker come from Stony Brook, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Again, just as a little nod to the readers to say, oh, right, oh, Tucker's from Stony Brook. But, and this is the spoiler part I don't want to give away, but mm-hmm. I kind of will a little bit. <laughs> As I knew where the story was going to go, mm-hmm. the two mythologies of these two stories cannot connect. Mm-hmm. So it would be weird to say he went to Stony Brook, which is a fictional town, yeah. to say, well, wait a minute, does this happen at the same time that Bobby Pendragon is doing his thing? It's two, the stories do not. So what I did instead is mm-hmm. I just called it Greenwich. I called it the town that I had based it on, because those can exist, because Stony Brook isn't real. So that's why I didn't. I, <laughs> so other than that, and then beyond that, there's absolutely no thematic no mythological crossover at all. This is totally clean. Okay. Um, is there a reason why you set it up against... Um, the plot is based on, you know, young adults facing kind of a, a greater power. Mm-hmm. Greater power here being, I'm guessing, well, the military, right? Or Maybe. As of what we're facing, military. <laughs> is there a reason why you chose the military as... Um, yeah, no, it's not. It's not a statement against or for or against the military. Mm-hmm. It, it just has to do with the fact that, as the story goes on, the scale becomes larger and the stakes become larger. And if this were really to happen, mm-hmm. uh, the military would get involved. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it's it, this is not a local dispute. This mm-hmm. is this is a large, large dispute, and and it stands to reason that the military would get involved. So yeah, so it's not a, it's not a comment on the military at all it's just that it's logical that they'd be part of this yeah <laughs> i remember reading a passage in silo where um it's more towards the end of the book tucker is kind of having a very introspective moment and he's covering how um he addresses basically his fear of failing in which he will not get involved in anything unless he knows that he has a decent chance of being mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay was that a message to your audience kind of Except that you will fail sometimes? Um, a little bit of that, but also a little bit of acknowledging that a lot of people feel that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know a lot of people, and sometimes I'm one of those people, that I would rather not give it a shot rather than look bad. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say that I'm coming out and saying, but you have to give it the old college try, very, yeah. you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to go so that far. It's more that what I try to do with my characters is have them have very real and relatable issues. Mm-hmm that someone along the line is going to read that and say, I know that feeling. I know it is. Because all my characters are very real characters. They're not, they're not, they don't have magic wands. They don't have superpowers. They, they are regular, usually Maybe. kids, mm-hmm. who are faced with irregular situation. And so my hope is that uh, you know, the reader will be reading along with that person and thinking, okay, 
I can see myself in this situation, and I have the same tools that this person has, so what would I do in this situation? Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the way I do that is by hopefully giving the characters real, relatable characteristics. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of them. And again, I, it, my characters are always faced with choices. And Tucker, many times he has the choice to just back off and let someone else do the heavy lifting um, because that's the way he had operated up to that point. Mm -hmm. But then he realizes, I can't, I've got to step up to the plate. So, yeah, I guess you could call it a message. I mean, it's not, it's not a beat your head over the head with a hammer yeah. message, but it's, it's a little It's underlined. It's, it's underlined. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the one underlying message, for lack of a better term or theme, that I have in all of my writing is the concept of self-empowerment. And maybe this is part of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, what I always do is I always put my characters into situations with conflict, and then eliminate their avenues to get help from somebody else. It's like that age-old thing where people say, oh, with Disney movies, how come the parents have to die? <laughs> it's like, they have to die because they have to be out of the equation, because mm -hmm. it's about the kid. Bambi's mom had to die. Um, Are You Afraid of the Dark? I did 91 episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark? We got rid of the parents 91 times. Yeah. Because it's about, because what the first thing a young person would do when they're in trouble, Is they go to their parents. parents. Yeah. So what I do is I take the parents out of the equation. Well. Now what do I do? I'll go to the police department. Well, they're ineffective. Okay, well maybe I go to the people in charge. Well, they're ineffective. What I do? So I constantly close off avenues to the point where the people realize the only person that can help me is me. Mm -hmm. It's up to me to do it. So that's <laughs> probably everything I've ever written has that theme in it. So to so mm -hmm. a certain extent, it's, it's not so much about overcoming fears as it is just realizing the best person you can rely on is, is yourself. Mm -hmm. It was very just emotional when I, um, when both Tori and Tucker, Tucker points it out, that they realize that they are alone in this, or, well, at that point they're mm -hmm. with friends, but okay. <laughs> they're alone in this, he can't count on his parents, neither can she at that point, and I honestly, I, I had never, or many stories come across with that type of plot, but it was just very impactful at that moment. Now, um, I kind of want to, like, make the atmosphere a little lighter, I'm going to ask you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> But um, did you base any of the names of your characters off of someone that you know? I remember reading, this is me being creepy, on an online forum that you named Dave Storm, I think, after a friend of yours. Or <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Dave Storm. Uh, oh, that was, it was a very small character. A lot of times with small characters, minor characters, I do that. I made a TV show called Flight 29 Down. Mm -hmm. And one of the stars of the show is a terrific actress named Lauren Storm. And her dad's name is Dave. And I met Dave. Dave Storm. Dave Storm just sounded like a newscaster. <laughs> Dave, Dave Storm, Storm, Action News. And whenever I'd see him, I'd say, hey, Dave Storm, Action News. I, don't know, I think he probably thought it was annoying. But <laughs> so when I got a chance, I'm like, I'm going to make a Dave Storm, Action News. And I wrote to Lauren and said, by the way, your dad's on the thing. Uh, President Richard E. Neff is in Silo. He, he has an office next to him. He's, he's, he's thrilled that he's the President of the United States. And so now he, he signs his emails, POTUS, P-O-T, President of the United States. Um, I think, well, who else did I use? Um, my favorite character I, name I ever did was in, in a Pendragon book. Uh, it was Pendragon 9, Raven Rise. And there was a character that I couldn't come up with a good name for. Him. Mm -hmm. But I was writing the outline. And I had to write something in the outline. So I put in a place marker. So uh, whenever I had to write his name, I would write name here. Mm -hmm. So it would be blah, 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 name here, goes to the store. Blah, 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 name here, talks to Bobby, blah, blah, blah. But eventually I had to come up with a name. So I called him Alexander Namir. I love stuff like that. Elegant. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Namir. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I do use friends. Pendragon, there's Andy Mitchell and, uh, and Mark Diamond. My two best friends growing up are Mark Mitchell and Andy Diamond. Uh, oh, I'll give you one. Um, I was here at Books and Books in Coral Gables two years, two years ago. Two years ago. Um, <laughs> And I was signing books, and uh, a young girl came up to me, and, and you, know, you asked what the name is to sign. And I said, uh, what's your name? She said, Tori Sleeper. And I was like, that's a really cool name. I said, I think I'm going to use that in a book. And she, I don't think she knew what to make of it, but she's like, okay, fine. I was like, I am, I am. And Silo, the Tori Sleeper is the edit. Oh and I God. think she was going to be here tonight. Yeah, I think she said she was going to in her blog or website or whatever. But I think she's going to be here tonight. That oh, yeah. is so sometimes amazing. <laughs> of course, now everyone's like, use my name. It's Ben, it's ben Smith. <laughs> it's a nice name. Yeah, okay, fine. It's Joe Jones. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes I use real people's names. 
What do you watch on the regular? What do you read? What do you like to soak up your inspiration from? I, I, I don't read the kind of stuff that I write. Mm-hmm. And the reason I don't is because I, it's like I know the tricks. And so it's really hard for me to read something because I see where they're going, where the author is going with these things. And mm-hmm. it's not that much fun. To, I, it's rare that I get surprised. So I don't read this kind of stuff. I mean, I do read it, but I don't, I don't, I'm not gravitating towards it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I read history. I read biographies. Um, I, some of my favorite authors, I like, like John Krakauer, uh, his adventure stories, but, you know, which are nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, who's the guy who wrote Fly Boys and Flags of Our Fathers? I mean, I really like reading history. And it seems like there are a lot of books now that are history written like fiction. Mm-hmm. So it's not dry. You know, it's really interesting. So that's really what I kind of gravitate towards. But I do like mysteries, and I'll read a Stephen King novel every once in a while, too. <laughs> um, but, that's, but, but the thing I often don't read, unless someone asks me to read their book to blurb it. Mm-hmm. Blurb is those things in the back where yeah. you say, the greatest book I ever read. So I'll read a number of those books. But, um, but mostly I, I go towards nonfiction. Okay. At one point, actually, while I was reading Silo, I was just kind of holding the book, and I was like, well, DJ McHale, it feels like Game of Thrones right now because you're just killing everyone I love. <laughs> and so was there a, a reason why maybe um, some deaths or deaths happened in the book? Did it mirror something that you experienced or any of the um, sort? Well, a couple of reasons for that. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I'm, I'm not going to be too specific in yeah. case you haven't read Silo yet. Um, when you're <laughs> the thing is, when, when you're reading a book series, you actually have more information than the characters do. Mm-hmm. That, char- that information being that you know it's a book. And you, the reader, know it's a book or it's a trilogy, which means the main character is probably not going to die until maybe the end. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it's like, well, so where does the tension come from, or where, where does the where does the je- jeopardy come from, or the tension out of the jeopardy? Because if you know they're not going to die, why do, so my rule of thumb is everybody else is fair game, uh, and usually the body count's pretty high. Mm-hmm. Um, with one in particular, which is maybe what you're referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, a character dies, a major character dies, and I did that specifically for a couple of reasons. I did it because I wanted to show the extent of how bad the situation is. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ramp it up for the reader to say, oh my gosh, this is no fooling around. This isn't just little kids running around. This is serious. Mm-hmm. But almost more important than that was it wasn't so much about that character, it was about Tucker, where any good story, the character wants something, and the conflict is what's preventing the character to get that, and what the events they go through that change who they are. And by that character, that happening to that character that I'm speaking very roundaboutly about, mm-hmm. by that happening to that character, that changes Tucker. That really makes him crystallize his, his agenda to suddenly stop being, uh, I'm not going to be any part of this, to realize, no, I, I, I am going to step up here, mm-hmm. whether it's for... for anger or vengeance or whatever and so that that incident really does change Tucker so it was much wasn't so much about what happened to the character as it was what happened to that character how it affected Tucker so that's why I did that particular one but other than that people have to die (laughs) or 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 you're just gonna be like oh it's a kiddie book and no one's gonna so people have to people have to die Mm. I did that with Pendragon literally I know I mean if (laughs) if a book's called Pendragon you know Pendragon's not gonna die to everyone he loves. <laughs> everyone else, yeah. It's like, it's funny you said that about Game of Thrones because a friend of mine uh, works on that show. He, uh, he does all the visual effects on that show. And I, I haven't been watching it. And I watched the first season and, and I'm really enjoying it. And mm-hmm. I said to him once, I said, uh, wow, I'm really liking the show. I like that character. And he goes, don't get too attached to anybody. <laughs> it's so true. They're don't. not going to be around. And so it's what you just said. All right. Um, let's see. And this is this is the geek in me, but when I was reading Pendragon, I was I really thoroughly enjoyed Hobie Ho. It was just a little statement, <laughs> and um, I think when I read uh, it was the forward, I think I don't remember, but you mentioned it at the end, and it brought back memories. And I was looking for something here, nothing of the sort, no similar statement. Um, but where did you get Hobie Ho from? I I actually know where I got it from. Hobie Ho came from two places. It was a combination of two things. Um, Hobie Ho was said by a character, Spader, who lived in that water world of Chloral. And he was always running around in his speeders and the jet skis and all that kind of stuff. So uh, a good buddy of mine used to work for a company called Hobie Sports. Hobie Sports makes outdoor wear, water wear, catamarans. So it's, it's like all water stuff. It's spelled differently, but it's Hobie. Mm-hmm. So that's where Hobie came from. Uh, 
the Hobie Ho came from a Ramon song, Blitzkrieg Bop, Hey Ho, Let's Go. So, <laughs> so I turned Hey Ho, Let's Go into Hobie Ho, Let's Go. So it's, for, it's the Ramones. Oh, <laughs> Do you know the amazing. song? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have any, you probably get asked this all the time. What is your advice for um, budding artists or writers or filmmakers? Um, get used to hearing no. Mm -hmm. You can't take no for an answer. Because no matter how great a thing you make, someone's not going to like it. And they'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. So you can't let that get you down. And you can't let that allow you to be discouraged. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't take criticism and make it better based on the criticism. But you will be hearing no quite a bit. Uh, that and if you want to pursue a career in the arts, mm -hmm. it takes a certain personality to do that. And, and I don't mean what their talent is. I mean their personality. Because, uh, and it's one of the reasons I got into it, frankly. When, why I transferred from Villanova University, where I was in pre-law, mm -hmm. to NYU, where I was film production. Where I'm not the kind of personality that can be doing a job that's the same thing every day. Where I know where I'm going to go to work every day, where I know what my paycheck's going to be, where I know what hours I'm going to work, where I know what my lunch hour is going to be. I just don't have that personality. Um, so the trade-off is when you do a profession or you follow a profession that's in the arts, it's so flexible. You never know when the next paycheck's going to come. Mm -hmm. Things are always changing. So you have to be able to withstand that. If, you, if you're not able to withstand the ups and downs, then you better get that job that's straight ahead. Yeah. Um, but no, if you are going to produce, if you have the personality that says, uh, I, I, can, I want things to change, then you're okay. A, a great thing happened once when I was in film school, uh, and it really... It was important to me. It was in a film school class, and there were big arguments going on between the students. They were like fighting over, I don't remember what it was, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was over a film or yelling and this, this kind of stuff, just really going over the top, silly young kid stuff. Mm -hmm. And the professor, who was like the, the, the major mentor to so many filmmakers, uh, his name is Haig Mnuchin, it was Haig Mnuchin, he's passed away, and he came up to the front of the class and he's laughing. And he was such a no-nonsense guy, and he said, look, look, mm -hmm. that's the way he talks, he says, look, he says, you guys, I want you guys to understand something. He said, if you, un, if you un, listen to what I'm going to say, and if you understand it, and you accept it, and you don't fight it, you're going to be fine. If you don't accept it, if you don't believe it, and you fight it, you better get out. And he said, just for the, you have to understand that just for the very fact that you're sitting in this room right now means you're a little bit off. <laughs> you're all a little bit off. You're not following the normal path the way other people follow it and accept that and embrace it, then you'll be okay. But if you try to, try to you know, push yourself into a, say, I, I need to follow the norm, I need to follow standards, it's not going to happen. So, so you can get out and get a job as an accountant right now. So that, that's my advice is be used to the ups and downs and get used to the, and, and, and the ups. And there are a lot of great ups too, believe me. That's, that's, that's a wonderful thing. But there are a lot of downs too. So you have to be used to, get used to that kind of stuff. Okay. What, is there a tie with that um, and your switch over from television to books? Or do you still do both? Well, I know you do books, but do you still yeah. do any television or film? Um, I, I haven't been doing kids' television for a long time because mm -hmm. kids' television has really changed. Uh, the kinds of shows that I like and, and the stuff that I enjoy making really isn't made anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't make dramas for kids anymore. Uh, it's a shame. There was a real renaissance in TV in the 70s, 80s, and 90s where you can get any, kids could get anything on TV. There's a lot made for them. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, there's not. I mean, there's some still some good stuff, and stuff for little kids is still pretty good. But for that age that that is attracted to my stuff, that kind of middle grade, tween into teen stuff, there isn't a whole lot of stuff except for these sitcoms. That you know, some of them are okay, but that's all there. It's a steady diet of that. And it's not very good. Yeah. So it was in, in working on a new show for Nickelodeon, a new drama, new a new. Uh, it was going to be a spooky show to take place of Are Afraid of the Dark? Mm -hmm. That was going nowhere, and ultimately they didn't do it because they said we're not doing dramas anymore. That's when I thought, you know. I think I'll write a book. I think it, I see the writing on the wall that the kind of stuff I write is not what kids' TV is anymore. Uh, on the film front, um, I'm very much involved. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we put together a package to make the Silo movie, um, and we're working on that right now. If the contracts ever get done, it's taking forever. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of, of pretty great people, a director and a writer and a producer. The woman who produces all the X-Men movies is going to produce it. Wow. So, yeah. So... That's not me. Not necessarily yeah. going to be made, but we're, we're going to start working on the script pretty soon. So, uh, so I still have a foot in the film business, mm -hmm. and you know I dabble a little bit, but it, it's books is where it's, it's at for me. 
Uh, are you excited if that were to happen to see your characters come to life? Oh, sure. I mean, because at heart, I'm, I'm a film guy. Mm -hmm. And and one thing that's kind of good about it is I don't think I'm being treated like a typical author who has no clue how to make films. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, you know, it's not just like, okay, thank you for the book. Thank you. Goodbye. You know, go mm -hmm. on your way. Go back to your typewriter. Mm -hmm. uh, they get that I know the lingo and I've made films before. So, so I'll be a producer on the film. So I'll be able to have a say to at least try to keep it close to what the... What, what the original vision is. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm a little nervous because, you know, it's never going to be exactly what I saw. Yeah. But that's, I mean, no book is. I mean, mm. how many times have you, you see no, the movie? No. It's never. Yeah, there are a few trade-offs, I guess. Yeah, there, yeah. there really is. I mean, you can't translate a book right to screen. Yeah. It doesn't happen. And one of the great things about books is that it, it's the best form of interactive fiction. Because when you're reading a book, you're making your own movie in your mind. You're casting it. Mm -hmm. You're directing it. You're putting your own music to it. And suddenly, if someone else makes those choices, it may not be the choice you would have made. So mm. therefore, it doesn't seem as good. So uh, I'm a little, a little nervous about that. But, 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 but I know it, so I'm not going to be like, oh my gosh, what have you done? It's, you know, it's, it's, that's not going to happen, I hope. <laughs> All right, so I'm, this is the last question, I think, because we've covered pretty much everything under the sun, I think. Okay. Are there any um, maybe small tidbits that we may not know about Silo that you are permitted to tell us? It can be a random fact, anything. Yeah, I can do that. Um, this is only this isn't a spoiler. This is a this is a warning. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> See um, I've been getting a lot of of grief. Is that the right word? Because Silo ends on such a big cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. um, what what I did with Silo, I, I I love writing villains. Villains are the most interesting characters to me, because the villains are the ones that are the geniuses that are coming up with these evil. The, the, the villains are like the authors. Mm. Heroes are noble and brave and all that kind of stuff, and they're going through trials and tribulations. But it's the villain that comes up with this stuff. So I love writing villains, yeah. and I like doing different things with villains. With Silo, at the end of the first book, you're not even sure who the main villain is. Mm. There are so many possibilities. So that's something that's very, very different. Here's the warning part. At the end of Storm, which is the second book, you'll know who the villain is. You know who the bad guy is. You know who you should be rooting for, for the most part. You know who you should be rooting for, you should be rooting against. But you still won't know why they're doing what they're doing. It's still, I mean, I've laid clues throughout, but you still won't know. It isn't until Strike comes out that I pull the curtain back and reveal really what it's all about. And, and of course, what I'm hoping is that readers will follow along and they'll get to that point when I reveal the whole thing, they'll just be like, Oh my <laughs> gosh, I didn't, oh, right, it was because he did that and she did that. And then it all kind of clicks together. My mm. fear is that somebody will read it and go, what? <laughs> a giant spider? <laughs> Reference to a certain book I will not mention. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think that's going to happen, mm. I, I think. And, and also, I will say one thing, and this is just me being proud of my work, mm. uh, the way the Silo Chronicles ends ends, like the last chapter. I love, some of my best writing that I feel I did is the way I summed up the Pendragon book mm -hmm. in that last chapter of the Soldiers of Hala. Um, the Silo Chronicles ends not in the same way, but I feel the same way about it, that I've come up with the, the kind of button up. I mean, the story ends, the story concludes, yeah. and then there's the kind of the wrap up of, of what the, uh, the epilogue is, and I'm really, really proud of that. And I think it's really, really cool, so I'm, I can't wait. It comes out in October. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait for, for people to get to that to read it to see. Hopefully they'll like it though as much as I do. Oh, I'm pretty sure they will. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me interview you today. DJ McHale, everyone, and this is Susie at The Inspirationist. Thank you and have a great day. Bye.